Shalom. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Good to see your faces as always, as uh, I know some people are uh, still being admitted from the waiting room. And for those watching on Facebook, uh, Facebook Live, uh, good afternoon to you as well. So this is series number two or session number two in our series on Jewish food, Jewish foodways. And today is dedicated to talking about the American Jewish food experience. So it's one of my favorite things to talk about. I had the privilege of being able to uh, be a TA, a teacher's assistant, uh, when I was a rabbinical student uh, for a professor who taught about this uh, to an undergrad undergraduate class. And so I got to learn along with the students. Um, and found the topic fascinating and eye-opening. So um, I wanted to share a little bit uh, of kind of the things that jump out of me when we talk about what food looks like to Jews in America. So there are three things we are going to talk about today. I'm gonna to try to get us through all three in our 60 minutes. The number one is a foreign non-American food that became Jewish. So a food that isn't American or Jewish originally, but is now seen as Jewish. The second thing we will talk about is a Jewish food, something that traditionally was viewed as Jewish that is now viewed by and large as simply American, uh, as having lost its Jewish, I don't know, gloss to it. Um, but if you go back historically, it would have been seen as an ethnic distinct Jewish food. And finally, uh, the last will be a quintessential American food that was not Jewish and in fact not um, permitted to Jews, uh, for the Jews that follow dietary practice, that became Jewish and became part of the American Jewish experience. So those are the three things we're going to look at uh, with hopefully about equal time given to each. And to make this fun, I brought them along. So there we go. Uh, and hold on, we want to see me too. Voila. Haha. -ha. So um, you might be able to figure out what we're talking about here. Uh, it's also my lunch, not my normal lunch. I, I want to be clear here, but you know, uh, today's special. So um, I think we're going to start with the foreign food that is neither American or Jewish, but became Jewish. And the reason we're going to talk about it is because that is the one that is hot right now. And, you know, I want to try it before it gets too much colder. Perfect. Um, and I use this, this definition uh, of this being food in the loosest possible sense, um, because, you know, the best I could do, I think I have the box around somewhere. Um, this is P.F. Chang's, oh, I'm using it to prop up my uh, table here, uh, P.F. Chang's uh, fried rice. So the idea is it's supposed to represent Chinese food. Um, to anyone who has actual uh, Chinese or Asian heritage, my apologies, uh, but you know, the idea is that we're talking about Chinese food here. Uh, and so you may be familiar with this uh, notion of Jews and Chinese food, of how these became connected. Um, and I should say, by the way, a, food, a foreign food that became Jewish. Chinese food is not, it's not Jewish, it, it's Chinese or it's, it's Asian, uh, but it is a food that is part of the Jewish American experience. Uh, so it is not a Jewish food. And I, 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 would, uh, I, I don't wanna imply that the food has now become Jewish. It, it clearly isn't, but it is a food that Jews um, gravitate toward uh, or historically have. Uh, and you may have heard some reasons why. Uh, the most common theory is that uh, well, you know, you've heard it before, we say it essentially every year that uh, Jews have to go somewhere on uh, December 25th, also known as Christmas, and Chinese restaurants are the only thing, uh, restaurants that appear to be open, uh, and that's why Chi Jews go and eat Chinese food, and that's where this connection is, and because Jews eat it on Christmas or on December 25th, and we'll call it Christmas, it's Christmas, uh, then, you know, Jews also like it at other times of the year. It makes some a certain amount of sense, um, but there are some holes in that theory. And you know, it is true that for most Chinese uh, are not uh, observing Christmas, or so therefore their their restaurants are, are open or they are working. Um, but there are a lot of other people in this world and communities in America uh, who come from places without Christianity or without large Christian communities uh, who also are working on December 25th or presumably have their restaurants open. 
Uh, but Jews don't go and eat, I don't know, pick anything, Ethiopian food. Uh, there are Christians in Ethiopia, but there are also non-Christians in Ethiopia, right? They don't eat Himalayan food, right? We could, keep, we could do this all day long uh, of restaurants Jews don't go to and would never really think to go to uh, on December 25th. So that's a little interesting. Why Chinese and not the other ones? So well, that may have something to do with it, uh, that's, there's a lot more to the story of how Chinese food became part of the American Jewish experience. So uh, the story I'm about to tell is based off of a research paper done in the early 1990s by Gay Tuckman and Harry Levine, um, both based in Queens College in New York City, which is a key element of our story. Uh, and they asked this question. They're not the only ones to, but this is the paper I'm, I'm familiar with. Uh, it's also been cited by a number of other writers and thinkers since of its publication. Uh, and so this is the, their theory and their connection that I will posit to all of you, um, which I find to be a fascinating story. So part of it is simply based on proximity, that uh, if you think about it, the, the, these two communities were next to each other. They both ended up in the Lower East Side uh, of Manhattan in New York City um, at the same time living among themselves. And the Lower East Side is where you ended up if you could not afford to live anywhere else. Uh, so this was a relative, <laughs> relatively, this was a poor immigrant area uh, where people, uh, ended up uh, coming to the new land, coming to the new world. Uh, and it was a place where if you could afford anything, you'd find you'd be able to afford a, a room uh, or a part of a room there. So you have Chinese and Jews uh, living next to each other. All right, but it's not quite so simple because first of all, it's not obvious just because they're neighbors that there's going to be any kind of cross-pollination. Uh, that's, uh, that's not given automatically. And also, the Lower East Side was not just filled with Chinese folks and Jewish folks. There were all kinds of people, all kinds of populations uh, that were also in this area, but yet it was these two, it was the Chinese food that Jews went to. Uh, and the other large population during the same time would have been Italians. So you have Italians, you have Jews, and you have Chinese folks. And again, many other groups too, but those were the three largest in the area at the time. So you're Jewish uh, and you come to America, you know, why wouldn't you, or wouldn't you, wouldn't you think, uh, just eat the food you're used to eating? Wouldn't you, that's the food you know, you came from Central or Eastern Europe, it's the only food you knew. Um, most of us like to eat the stuff that we grew up eating. Uh, that's just kind of, it comes automatically unless we're intentionally trying uh, to do something different or to explore something for whatever reason. And that's part of the story or part of the theory that, uh, that the authors bring out here, that the Jewish community at this time coming to America they were interested in becoming American. They didn't want to be Central Eastern European Jews anymore. They were that, but many of them, not all, but many of them said, this has been a rough, hard life in history. And the whole point, I, the whole reason I came to America was so that I could get rid of all of that. Um, and I could be something else, that I didn't have to be a persecuted Jewish minority anymore, but I could be an American in a way that it wasn't possible. I was never going to just be able to be like, hey, I, I'm a Pole now, I'm Polish now, and, and have Polish people be like, yeah, sure. That wasn't going to happen. And I knew that, and that's the whole reason I didn't try to do this over there where I got on a boat and came all the way over here because I thought that this was the new, this was a new land for me and a new way for me to be. Um, so, you know, they weren't necessarily tied to their old food ways. Uh, another part of it is uh, what is the Jewish food way exactly? Uh, what is the closest thing to a Jewish cuisine? Uh, a lot of Jewish cuisine that we think of is based upon you know, dishes that were also popular in those areas there. So I saw, I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but um, the potato latka, Jews are not the only people to think about frying up a potato uh, and putting some salt on it. That's, we're not the only ones to come up with that idea. In fact, you can find that anywhere where they grow potatoes, uh, including Chinese cuisine has something kind of similar in like a scallion pancake. Uh, it's kind of similar, different, but just to give you a sense, like, you know, there are varieties in places you wouldn't even necessarily expect, but if you go to Central or Eastern Europe, 
you'll find in German, regular old German restaurants or Polish restaurants, they're serving fried potato pancakes left and right. Anyway, but what is the closest thing to a Jewish cuisine? It would be something like deli. Uh, and this is what we think of now when we think of Jewish restaurants, right? It's the Jewish deli. Uh, and the problem with Jewish deli, it's not a problem, but an attribute of it is it's relatively simple. Uh, so why didn't Jews want to go to Jewish deli restaurants? They did. But one thing, and it was a nice little interview from uh, someone in their paper here, was why would I want to go and eat food I can just make at home? Which you can say about a lot of stuff, but deli in particular, <laughs> it's bread, <laughs> it's cuts of meat. You know, there's really not much skill or effort. If I was going to just whip something up at home, that was easy if I didn't feel like cooking, you know, other than like a microwavable meal, which they, it wasn't in their radar quite yet, you know, whipping up a sandwich, that's, uh, that's pretty low stakes. So, you know, if this is deli, not that it's not good, but it's so it's relatively simple. So like the attraction of I'm going to go and pay two or three times as much for like, I'll do that every now and then, but I'm not going to do that regularly or most people aren't because I can have the same thing at home. Um, so why were the Jews going to the Chinese restaurant and not the Italian restaurant, though? Uh, that's a question, too. And also, why weren't the Italian people going to the Chinese restaurant? or I suppose the deli, uh, you know, we can ask the question, and where are the Chinese people going to either of these two, uh, which wasn't addressed in this paper, I'd be curious too to know that story. Um, but why were, why the Chinese uh, restaurant? And this is where they get into a few different concepts. Number one is historical and has to do with anti-Semitism. Uh, when people open restaurants, they're opening it for their own communities, of course, at least originally. Um, and an Italian restaurant is gonna be filled with Italian culture, which is largely Catholic culture which is largely going to be a bit alienating to Jews to see um, uh, Christian uh, objects on the wall, paintings or a crucifix or whatnot. That's not gonna be the most inviting thing if you're Jewish or the thing that you're really super excited to be around. Also, Italians know who Jews are and doesn't mean all Italians are anti-Semitic or anti-Jewish, um, but, and Jews know Italians know, and there's this history there. Uh, and so whether or not anything bad would have happened if a Jew went into an Italian restaurant, um, there might be that fear that like, why would I want to go there? Um, I'm not comfortable with that. Uh, whereas a Jew going into a Chinese restaurant, uh, and Jews realize this, that from a Chinese perspective, Jews weren't Jews, they were white. They were just Anglo white Americans. And like, yeah, they maybe look different or their accent was different, but if you don't have any familiarity with the intricacies of European ethnicity and ethnic groups and minorities, there's none of that baggage. Uh, and so you were just white. And that was one of the few places where you could be just white for better or worse, um, by the way, not always a happy story there. Um, and Jews kind of took advantage of this uh, experience, or that was one uh, uh, narrative drawn out of being in a place where suddenly they were the boss and otherwise everywhere else they were on the bottom of the social totem pole essentially, or the social ladder in the larger society, except in the Chinese restaurant, because Jews and Chinese were at the bottom uh, of the social hierarchy as immigrants. Um, but unfortunately, uh, or it is what it is, the Chinese were rung below. Uh, and so, you know, if you're at the bottom, but there's still someone just below you, well, that's, people respond differently in that situation. Uh, so talk about Chinese food. Mine's cooled quite a bit since then. Um, but so, gosh, where was I before all of this? Um, <laughs> So Jews end up in Chinese restaurants because the Italian restaurant's not going to be an option for them. Um, but also there's another element of Jew or Chinese food is not technically, for the most part, kosher friendly, meaning Chinese cuisine has a lot of shellfish, um, has a lot of pork products. So it might not seem like an obvious fit for Jews, but I think this is the most fascinating explanation or theory about this story. So why would Jews flock toward a cuisine that has so many minefields um, in terms of dietary law? And it is because for many of these Jews, like I said, they were coming to a new world, ready to cast off the world they had come from, and they didn't want to keep kosher anymore. 
They wanted to eat like everyone else. Funny, eat like everyone else, so they're going to pick Chinese food, which no one at the time is really eating besides Chinese people. Um, so they, the fact that there is treif or that there is non-kosher meats in Chinese food isn't a drawback, but it's a benefit to many of these Jews. Now, again, though, we have a question. While well, Chinese cuisine is not the only cuisine that uses pork, um, the Italians, again, would have had plenty of options, but there is a difference. And that has to do with this concept of safe treif. Treif means non-kosher food. Safe means, well, safe. And this is a little hard to uh, wrap your head around if you did not grow up avoiding certain foods. But if you did, if you were taught your whole life that pork, I'm gonna pick on pork, is disgusting or foul or just gross, not edible or not for you to eat, it doesn't really matter for most people if someday a light switch goes off in their head and they say, you know what, I don't care anymore because you have been conditioned your entire life to see that and to say that is not food to the point where people who try, you may have a gag reflex, perfectly good piece of bacon or something, but if you've spent your whole life you know, convincing or in an environment where this is not something you eat, it's very hard to actually eat it. Even if some intellectual part of you says, I don't care about avoiding it now, or even I want to eat it. Very difficult. Uh, but again, if you haven't grown up with that kind of prohibition, um, it's kind of hard to appreciate. So I can use an analogy, which most of us have probably grown up with. We do not, for the most part, consider bugs to be food. Most of us did not grow up eating fried crickets as a snack. Now, if you've read anything, if you're on any environmental blogs or sites, you've probably seen articles that insect-based protein is actually incredibly sustainable. Um, it's good for the environment. You can grow a lot of insects without a lot of energy inputs compared to poultry or beef or uh, pork, um, that they convert a lot of the feed you give them into protein very quickly. And there are all sorts of good reasons to say, you know what, it would make a lot of sense to start eating crickets or anything else, mealworms, whatever. Um, but if you've grown up like me uh, your whole life, uh, not considering a cricket to be food, well, it'll probably be pretty hard. Some people can do it and some people do, of course, but most people are gonna have a really tough time uh, chucking that deep fried cricket into their mouth for the first time. Um, Again, no matter, it's not about it tasting bad, it's about what it is, your condition. This is not something to be eaten. This is something to spit out or you throw out your food if you ever saw a bug in it, right? Right, you see a bug in your salad, you send the salad back. Uh, not just the bug, but the whole salad. So to get beyond that is very hard. Um, but so to use this analogy for how this works uh, according to the theory with Jews, well, maybe I can't eat deep fried crickets, but there's something called cricket flour. And it is what you can imagine it is. It's a bunch of crickets ground up into a protein flour and you can use it uh, in, well, anything. I don't think it behaves quite like flour. I don't think you can make cricket bread uh, and just do a perfect substitution, never tried. Um, but you could put it into baked goods, one of the uses for it. Uh, and yep, yeah, not gonna taste like cricket. <laughs> not gonna know, I could feed you a cricket flour cookie and you would not know I have given you a cricket flour cookie until I told you or unless I told you, at which point a few things may happen. You may find out I just fed you cricket and feel ill, or if you're someone who wants to eat cricket, because again, environmental reasons can't stomach actually eat one, maybe that cookie is the way you're gonna do it because it's a lot easier to eat a cookie than it is to eat a cricket. If if you think cricket, not food. That is the concept here. What does this have to do with Chinese food? Well, here's my fried rice. Can you tell what protein's in it? No one can, or it's very hard to, uh, because Chinese cuisine is generally uh, minced or diced uh, small bits of meat that is coated in a sauce. It's not the same as bacon. It's not the same as a pork chop. It is not obvious what you're eating most of the time. So 
for a Jew who wants to adopt new food practices but has that initial revulsion, Chinese food is a great uh, entryway to be able to do that. It's also a way to have shalom bayit. So you have multiple generations uh, all going to dinner together. Maybe grandpa is never going to eat treif, um, but son and granddaughter or whoever else, well, they could order something. And we can all pretend it's not there because you can't really tell anyway. Uh, and you can share that meal together in a way that you couldn't in other cuisines. So that's one of the, the theories for why Chinese food took hold. Um, and it goes on also this idea of exoticism, that for Jews, they wanted to feel worldly and sophisticated. Um, and this is still, this is true today, that people seek out foods that are not popular or well-known uh, for a variety of, of reasons. I remember when I was in Boston um, as a young uh, person just at graduating college of uh, regularly going to an Ethiopian restaurant um, with some friends of mine. Why? I'm not Ethiopian they weren't Ethiopian. What on earth were we doing there? Well, and also if you looked in the dining room, it was filled with other people who did not appear to be Ethiopian. Well, because it's sophisticated and it's worldly and it's cultured. And doesn't it make you seem more uh, of a, a thoughtful intellectual person going to eat Ethiopian than it would be to go get fast food somewhere like everyone else does, or to just go to Olive Garden, not to pick on Olive Garden. Um, I, you know, I'm fancy and I'm not afraid to, to, be, to try things that aren't as well known or understood. So that was part of it too. Uh, there's a nice quote here. Uh, from someone, I felt about Chinese restaurants the same way I did about the Metropolitan Museum of Art. They were both two, the two most strange and fascinating places my parents took me to, and I loved them both. Uh, from a child remembering his childhood growing up in New York, uh, that these are places that weren't like anywhere else. They were so different, and that was exciting, exhilarating. Um, and it comes here. Um, I'll share this, uh, that so when Jews started moving from the Lower East Side to uh, other parts of Manhattan and eventually the suburbs, Chinese restaurants went along with them. Here's a quote. Sociologist Clarence Lowe reports that his parents were scientists who in the early 1940s immigrated from China to Philadelphia, so a Chinese family. His family usually ate at Chinese restaurants in Jewish neighborhoods because that's where the good Chinese restaurants were. His, uh, the, per the Chinese person's quote, that if you wanted to find good Chinese, whether you're Jewish or not, you didn't look for the good Chinese restaurant, you looked for a Jewish neighborhood because the good Chinese restaurant was understood it would likely be there. Um, that was something a Chinese person grew up learning. Uh, so kind of fascinating story here of what linked these two communities. Um, but it's also, there's something, not quite a backlash, but it's gone the other way. But this exoticism, Chinese food is not seen by most people, I think, as exotic anymore. It's seen as a kind of blasé American, a standard American fare. There's nothing particularly special about Chinese food compared to, um, you know, other cuisines. Again, if I want to be exotic, I'm going to go to a Himalayan restaurant, uh, something that, you know, well, what's that? No one has that reaction, I don't think, or most Americans to Chinese food. Um, it's, you know, Mark P.F. Chang's uh, picked up from the Kroger frozen food section this morning, for better or worse. Uh, so uh, some Jews are no longer as attached to Chinese food as they once had been. A few Jews note now in their 40s told us that eating Chinese food actually has such strong associations with Jewishness that they avoid Chinese restaurants. So remember the whole allure of Chinese food was that it was the anti-Jewish food. It was something you could do to break away from Jewish culture if you were looking to reinvent yourself in America. And now it is so tied to Jewish culture that people say, oh, I just, I want something that's not so Jewish. So I don't, I just can't go to a Chinese restaurant because it's just too Jewish for me. Uh, so we've come, it's for some people, you know, it's not, Certainly not universal, but uh, at least one person's experience uh, quoted in the paper of, you know, had the uh, gone in the opposite direction. All right, so we talked about the Chinese food, about a foreign non-American food that be became Jewish or became a popular food among Jews. Uh, let's talk about a Jewish food that became American. We'll go in order of uh, a meal here. So I have 
a sad, misshapen, plain bagel, but not just any bagel, a lender's bagel. And that's for a reason. And I first was worried when I went to Kroger, I was like, oh no, they don't have lender's bagels. Uh, but I found them. They are in not the frozen section and not the fresh bread section. They're in the refrigerated bread section, which is a section, small, uh, toward the back. Uh, and you'll find a few of these uh, if you're so curious. But I picked lenders for a reason. Uh, so bagels were, uh, there's a lot of written about the history of the bagel, uh, but it was certainly uh, a food known by Jews in Central Europe, um, known by other people too. Uh, and again, uh, lest you think Jews are not the only people to think about making dough into a circle, uh, you know, like this is not a revolutionary idea. You can find things that look like bagels all over the world. Um, but this was something that Jews would have been familiar with. So they come to America and you know, they're making the foods that they're used to as well, as well as experimenting with other stuff. Um, but bagels are a little challenging to work with uh, for a few reasons. Number one, um, not anyone can make a bagel. I don't know if anyone's ever tried to make a bagel. I have not, but I have seen people who have tried to make bagels and they don't look like this, even this sad misshapen one. Um, if you try to make bagels on your own, from what I have, all I have seen until you get some practice, they're gonna look weird, uh, is at least my anecdotal observations. Um, and that's because my theory is that, you know, a bagel has to be perfectly the same thickness when you make the circular ring of dough. And if it's a little off, even a little bit, well, you know, stuff rises and it's going to become this lumpy, sad looking, weird mess. Again, my anecdotal experience, no disrespect to any bagel makers there. Um, and it actually takes a lot of skill to make a bagel. So not anyone, not everyone can do it. And in New York City, uh, which was the heart of the American bagel uh, uh, industry, uh, this was a union job. Bagel Bakers Local 338 was the union of bagel makers. There were about 350 workers uh, and just the stats here. And this was, this was a skilled profession. Like I said, it takes a lot of training, apprenticeship to be able to learn how to form a bagel correctly. And also there's some secrets about the dough and how to proof it and all of that. Um, so the mechanics of actually forming it, but also how you do everything else and how you bake it and all of that. Um, so, uh, a skilled bagel worker could make about 90 bagels an hour, um, someone who is trained to do this. So that's, uh, what is that, one and a half bagels a minute or so to give you some sense. And that's, that's not, that's just starting with a big mound of dough, taking some out and forming it into the ring. Uh, and so that takes about uh, nine, well, it takes 90 seconds to make, I'm sorry. My math is off here, um, but you can make about 90 of them in an hour or so. Uh, that's less, it's not two a minute, but you, know, you get, we're talking about small numbers here. Um, and so, and bagels also don't last very long. Uh, even like the lenders ones, I suspect even though they're in the frozen section or the, fre or the refrigerated section, lenders is famous for freezing bagels uh, that Kroger defrosts them and puts them there. It's a guess, maybe not, but um, still, uh, Distribution wise, you don't have much time. A bagel lasts about a day before no one wants to eat it anymore. So as a result, if you wanted bagels, the only place you were gonna find them was really the East Coast, places like New York and Philadelphia. Uh, and that was really it. But Jews didn't live in those places. I don't have to tell you that. Jews lived all over the country, uh, but they wouldn't have had access to bagels. What they would have had is this knowledge that Jews are supposed to eat bagels, and just another thing to feel guilty about that I'm a bad Jew because I've never had a bagel before. Uh, but if you didn't live in these concentrated areas, then you, you wouldn't have, um, it, it, you, would, you would not have had an opportunity to. And that all changed with the lenders company who made two innovations. Number one, um, they were allegedly New York bagels, but they were all made in New Haven, Connecticut, which is 80 miles away from uh, New York for whatever that's worth. And the lenders realized uh, first that if they they could freeze their bagels, uh, and the, when you can freeze things, they obviously can last longer. And what they also discovered was that if they defrosted them the day before, no one appeared to notice the difference. That a defrosted bagel 
Yeah, I know you're all going to say I can tell the difference. Sure you can. Uh, but apparently no one could figure it out until there was some mishap and someone forgot to defrost them or the bagels were still frozen. And then um, people realized, wait, these have been frozen. What have you done? But they said, you've been eating them for years and you never cared before. Why do you care now? So number one, they realized it was okay to freeze them and therefore you have more options for distribution. And number two, in 1962, they bought the first automatic bagel machine. So this is a machine that can replace this highly skilled specialized worker. And it can make four times the amount of bagels as a human can uh, per hour, per unit of time. And you don't have to pay it once you buy it. So uh, soon after that, the uh, Bagel Bagers Local 338 within a decade was no more uh, put out of business. Many people believe that a machine-made bagel does not have the same quality as a handmade bagel. Uh, and feel that there is a difference. Uh, but lenders now had uh, perfected their art of freezing bagels and of making way more bagels than they could sell locally now that they bought all these expensive bagel making machines. So they started to distribute. Uh, and first their market was to Jews who wanted bagels uh, and could not have had access to them before. They thought that would be their market, people who knew what this was. Uh, and everyone else would have thought that this was an odd, weird, ethnic, food. And I realize that sounds preposterous. Like, how could anyone look at this? It's a roll, right? Or, you know, it's, it's, it's bread and think that this is strange or, or like something weird. But if you're thinking that, here's an example. Um, oh, no, uh, I don't know if I can share my screen. Let's see if we can make that happen quickly. If not, we'll move on. Uh, hold on. There we go, okay. And hopefully this is the one I wanted to share. Yes, okay. So this is Obverzhanek. This is the Polish and Krakow, Southern Polish equivalent of a bagel. They sell these on the streets everywhere uh, in giant uh, carts um, and it's, you know, it's street food. Um, but if you've never seen one before, it looks weird, even though it's just bread, it tastes like a bagel, it kind of sort of looks like one, but it's not quite right. And so you wouldn't, if you saw this on the shelf at Kroger and you didn't know from before what it was, you would probably think that's weird looking bread. And not that you'd be freaked out, but like it would be weird. So just to give you an example, that's something even when you put the circle bread in a slightly wider diameter is enough for it to become foreign and strange. Nothing like it's poppy seeds and sesame seeds. Even the toppings are the same. It's just the shape. But at least to me, I look at that. I'm like, that's funny looking. Um, so that would have been the response to people who saw this. But eventually, as you know, time goes on, um, the bagel becomes more and more American to the point where we have places like Panera and everywhere else. And a bagel is not even, I mean, I think most people, when I talk to non-Jewish groups, I don't think that they see this, a bagel, as a Jewish food. I think it's as American as a muffin at this point. Um, and you actually have to say no. <laughs> This was once exotic ethnic food to most Americans, uh, but it has become an American food. So the last story I want to tell uh, is about an American food that became Jewish, and that is the mighty Oreo cookie. Um, I'm sure I've got my facts here, or my little uh, factoids. Okay. Um, so Oreos were made by Nabisco, uh, were originally made with lard, rendered pig fat, which if you're Jewish, that's kind of a, a no-go. If you're someone who keeps kosher, if you're a Jew, like I talked about a lot of Jews who uh, were perfectly happy giving up kosher dietary restrictions, they didn't care, I, I assume, or some of them wouldn't have cared. But if you do care, um, you know, there's no getting away around lard. Um, that's about as, as trafy as you can get in a food, other than like just a straight up, uh, you know, piece of bacon or something. So uh, Jews wouldn't, did not have America's cookie. Uh, Oreo was 
the early 20th century, you know, the quintessential American cookie, the best cookie. Um, instead, Jews had access to Hydrox, which has its own story, uh, which you know, I've heard Hydrox gets a bad rap uh, and, and is really unfair the reputation as a second-rate Oreo, that there's more to it than that. But regardless, Oreo was the cookie you wanted. Hydrox was the cookie you settled for in the eyes of many people. It's Coke versus like RC Cola or whatever, you know, Kroger branded cola um, is there with a weird name where, I don't know, the Kroger Cola, I'm not sure I've had it. I don't drink a lot of soda, but maybe it tastes great. But I know it's not Coke. <laughs> um, and so I already don't like it as much, uh, even before I've tasted it. So that was kind of the Jewish story for most of the 20th century until uh, the mid 1980s or so, um, just by apparent chance, uh, someone who knew someone, a Jewish person who knew someone at Nabisco asked, what would it take to make Oreos kosher? Almost as a joke, according to the story. And this anecdote comes, by the way, from a great book, uh, Kosher Nation, which has so many wonderful stories just about how the kosher process works in America and different, uh, really, I mean, it's eye opening. It's a great read. It's a fun read, highly recommended. But uh, the story is in the introduction. So, based off of that conversation, the executive, for whatever reason, actually went to find out. And the number came back. To make Oreos kosher would cost $8 million. So why would that be? <laughs> Number one, that doesn't have to do with reformulation because that was actually already happening. Uh, that uh, lard is a uh, saturated fat and those were you know, seen to be unhealthy in the early 90s. So they went with the healthy alternative, which were trans fats. Uh, which we now know are awful. Um, I don't know if they're better or worse than saturated fat, uh, but all of these partially hydrogenated oils are now seen as being incredibly harmful, but at the time we're seen as a healthy alternative. But anyway, Oreo was riding that. So they were switching to a vegetable-based shortening Crisco-ish stuff, and no, it wasn't Crisco, but uh, away from animal uh, products. So the cookie itself, was by just by accident becoming kosher or made with kosher ingredients. Um, but that's only a little part of it. So the $8 million is not to figure out how to make Oreo with different ingredients. The $8 million is to figure out how to fix all of the ovens. Because once an oven has been trafed or you know, you've cooked lard in your oven in your giant cookie oven, that oven is no longer kosher. And anything else that goes through that oven, doesn't matter if it's a day or a month or a year later, that won't be kosher either, just by a fact of it having passed through a non-kosher oven. So to give you some sense here, each Oreo oven was 300 square feet uh, and there were 10 ovens per Nabisco plant. And there were about 10 plants in the country. So you have 103, you have yeah, 100, 300 square foot ovens that need to be made kosher. And the way you do that is you go around by hand with a blowtorch, burning at high temperature every square inch of those ovens. That wasn't the hard part. The hard part apparently was that the way that these mechanized ovens worked was that there were these uh, rubber conveyor belts that put the Oreos uh, through the oven uh, and, uh, in a mechanized way. And you can't uh, blowtorch rubber, obviously. So they had to replace these uh, 100, am I getting the numbers right? Yeah, 100 giant uh, rubber belts. Uh, and so Oreo decided to wait until the belts were going to be replaced anyway. And that took a number of years to get through that maintenance cycle. But once they did finally, um, it was October, 1997 when Oreos became kosher and when the Oreos package could have for the first time a little kosher hector on it, this little symbol, the OU, Orthodox Union, that's the agency that certifies Oreos and the D means it's kosher and it's dairy. Um, and that happened for the first time, October, 1997. So some quotes here from Joshua, uh, Rabbi Joshua Hammerman, the news that Oreos were kosher came racing across the internet with apocalyptic urgency. The 1997 internet, mind you. Uh, uh, and he goes on, Jews have finally made it. 
After 85 years in the Gentile larder, in the cupboards of Gentiles, Oreos have gone kosher. Uh, and that this was a quintessential moment, because again, this is as American as apple pie, a little Oreo cookie. And it was something that for Jews who kept kosher, they were reminded of at every, you know, every instance. And Oreos, it's not just Oreos, but it's so many other processed foods too. But Oreos is a great example that you're not quite really American. Because while everyone else is drinking their Coke, you got your RC Cola. Coke is kosher, by the way. So that's not, it's an analogy, not literal. But, you know, you've got, you've got your Hydrox. Uh, while everyone else eats what everyone has agreed, what right or wrong is the better cookie is Oreo. Uh, and here it was that we can eat the same junk food, a highly processed, partially hydrogenated oil filled stuff uh, as everyone else something that for Jews their whole life they knew, I can't eat those. Uh, when I see them you know, uh, served at someone's house or whatever, they're not for me. Um, so, but something else interesting here, but the breakthrough contained a touch of the bittersweet. As Hammer, Rabbi Hammerman sat in the kitchen late one night in January, 1998, contemplating the kosher Oreo he was about to enjoy. He thought about how kashrut, kosher laws had always set Jews apart from the nations around them. Every time Jews resist the temptation to indulge in a pepperoni pizza or a cheeseburger, they reaffirm their uniqueness. Is eating Oreos a step toward assimilation? What would happen to the Jewish people if they ate just like everyone else? I shudder, he wrote. Can we survive this? Well, that may seem a little overly dramatic. I think the Jews did survive the, the koshering of Oreos, but it speaks to a larger point that a lot of Jewish food ways are defined by making having to make constant, cons, constant choices about what can and cannot be eaten. To be Jewish or a Jew who keeps kosher is to have to think really hard about the foods that you put into your body um, because you know a large percentage of the food is not for you. And for people who don't grow up with those kinds of restrictions, um, it's a whole different way of looking at the, at the world and at how you eat and how you consume. Um, and also something that you know, is maybe unique to the diaspora experience. I know I've talked to, for a lot of folks um, who keep kosher, when they go to Israel, it's this overwhelming experience because you can go to Israel and you can go to the kosher McDonald's and you can go to the kosher KFC and the kosher this, that, and the other thing, because you can't go to those places here. Um, that's not an option in America because those foods are not kosher here, but in Israel it is. But there's something that's people will say, you know, feels like something's lost just a little bit going into a restaurant and knowing I, I can eat anything on the menu and don't have to think about it. Or, you know, I can go to the grocery store and don't, every single product in this grocery store is kosher. And I don't, so, and I don't even have to think or check other than is it meat or is it dairy or is it parv, meaning it's neither of the two, um, which is relatively easy. Um, and so you no longer, it's all, it's all just there for you. Whereas to be the minority, um, there's this effort put into it. So it's totally different in that way. So I think that's why I shared that quote of like, yeah, it seems like it's great when, when Jews can just eat just like regular Americans, but you know, for a Jew who kept kosher saying, you know, I, maybe it's not that great. Uh, maybe, maybe it should be a little harder or maybe it should be a little more difficult to be Jewish. And it's not just about the Oreo cookie. That's a nice example, but all of these processed foods, if you look at most most, it seems like most processed food that isn't something obviously not kosher like pork rinds, um, you'll see a kosher symbol on it. Um, the exceptions like Doritos aren't because cheese is complicated, but things that don't have some cheese or cheese-like product, um, potato chips, all that kind of stuff, a lot of it's kosher now. Um, you don't have to try that hard to find kosher food. So or better or worse. Um, so that is a little dive through the American Jewish kosher experience or Jewish food experience. Um, hope that hopefully it was interesting. I do highly recommend uh, Kosher Nation again. Um, this, this book uh, there. Uh, and also, if you're interested in the Chinese food um, uh, story, then uh, if you Google the phrase safe trafe or really just Jewish people Chinese food, 
uh, you'll find links to news stories that, that talk about the, the article uh, or a link to the article itself. It's hosted by Queens College in New York online as a free PDF. So, um, you know, if, if there are any, I see a comment here. Let me see what the comment was. <laughs> Looks a little like a Bavarian pretzel. Ah, for my uh, Obergenic, my uh, Krakow bagel. Yeah, I suppose it does. Um, and again, that's all similar. Like I said, Jews are not the only people to think about making a string of dough and you know, baking it in a shape. Uh, so yeah, it, it's similar. Uh, I don't know if there are other questions or thoughts and then we can call it a day. All right, well, thank you very much for um, sticking by all of you who stayed on for the 10 minute hiatus while we got our hotspot going. Uh, I'm flattered. Uh, hope it was interesting and worth your time. And, and thank you all so much. Uh, we will, Rabbi Jeff and I are going to conclude together the series in two weeks, not next week, but in two weeks. Uh, so we'll see you then. And uh, Shabbat Shalom as well. Take thank care, you everybody. very much. <laughs>